Hello and welcome to another episode of the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Samolski, joined as always by my co-host, Scott Pianowski. Scott, we've got more injury news to start the show off with. Um, it feels like it's, I mean, it's. I know it's always like this in baseball. Um, it feels a little more so this year. Um, and this first one stings us in our fandom as well, too. Yeah, this this fantasy baseball season is starting to feel like a fantasy football season where it's just carnage, carnage, carnage. You're filling up those IL spots, and you're—I mean, all you can keep doing is make good decisions, right? And you hope that the compounding of good decisions will put you in a good place in the second half of the season. But I understand that it's a grind a lot of times when you, you have, especially your players who are playing well, you get hurt. Nothing more frustrating than that. But hopefully, the next hour can give you some solutions. Yes, that's that's the goal. That's the plan. You know, we talked about this a little bit before we started. Uh, you're not gonna fix everything, right? And I think that we need to get out of our heads that like we can make ourselves whole all the time uh, when we get these injuries. It's just how can I make the best decision for my team in that particular context? Um, I still am a believer. Tell me if you agree before we get into this news. I'm still a believer, and like we're early enough in the season where. If I have a player going down, I'm trying to just add the most talented player who fills that spot in my lineup. I'm not yet saying, hey, I really need runs or, hey, I really need stolen bases. Now, that will that shifts if the guy who's hurt is like your main was your main source of stolen bases. Right. But generally speaking, if you are losing a hitter, if you're losing a starting pitcher, I'm looking just at replacing that player with the most talented player I can get and not so much trying to hit a category need where we're at right now. Mostly agree with you. I, I know Ron Chandler said many years ago that he would draft for value and think about balancing during the season. And I still think that that ethos, which is pretty much what you just said about, I'm just trying to make my team better and I'll worry about balancing it later. There were a couple of leagues where I don't have a lot of stolen bases and Luis Garcia is playing pretty well for the Nationals. He's just yep. 9% rostered in Yahoo and he's been running lately. I think he had four stolen bases in his last three games. He's also batting cleanup. I know the Washington lineup isn't the most exciting lineup in the world, but he was somebody maybe I – maybe with st saves and steals it's a little bit different where if somebody's running or getting saves, yes, we're willing to overlook a lot of things they don't do because that, that that's a low bar for relevance. But yeah, and – and we'll we'll definitely we're definitely gonna talk about um, for sure for sure. But I I want to I want to just underscore what you said that you just try it, it's it's kind of like in in baseball right. What everybody does early on is you try to play for a big inning and score a bunch of runs, and then and, and bunting like in the first inning and the second inning of a baseball game is like almost always just stupid. But yeah. then late in the game when you need one run to win, bunting can be the right thing because you does, the five run inning doesn't matter anymore. You're just trying to win the game, so. What I want you to do right now is play for the beginning, make your team as good as you can. And when the season gets deeper and the categories have personality and shape to them, then we'll figure out, okay, these are the trades that make sense, or these are the categories that you can trade from. And mm -hmm. these are the categories you need to fix. Maybe these are the categories you need to punt. None of that stuff's in play right now. Right now you're just trying to build the best monster you can build. Agreed. Um, and so we'll jump right in the, um, the injury that, that Scott and I are referencing uh, for our fandom, our Red Sox fandom, is Tristan Casas, um, who took a swing um, on Saturday, grabbed his oblique, um, and everybody thought it was an oblique injury, but then the Red Sox referred to it as a rib, a left rib strain. Um, we don't have any word. He's getting an MRI today, Monday. The Red Sox don't play until Tuesday, so um, they're probably not going to make any extra moves until they have to on Tuesday. We should hear on Monday the extent of the injury. Obviously, when we do, you'll know a little bit more about how you want to approach this. All indications from the Red Sox are that it is something relatively serious. Um, Alex Cora said he's not optimistic. Uh, they mentioned that, you know, Casas is in a, a, you know, a good deal of pain. Casas himself mentioned that he's in a good deal of pain. Um, you know, I... I think this is multiple weeks. Obliques can also linger. So you could be looking at, you know, six weeks, maybe longer. Um, I think all we can tell people right now is that you're putting Casas on your IL. You're not cutting him and you're keeping your fingers crossed for, you know, something not terrible when the MRI comes out. 
Why can't the Red Sox have nice things? Tyler O'Neill is off to a monster start. He's hurt right now, not as serious as Casas, but he's hurt. Casas is hurt. They've had a lot of pitching injuries, of course, which is endemic in baseball right now. I want Trevor to- Story. For sure. Yeah, Trevor Story, who we thought was going to fix the defense. He wasn't hitting yet, but now, you know, his season is basically over. I want to, you talked about Cora and, and Casas, what they were saying about the injury. And this underscores a rule of mine. It's kind of just a common sense BS detector rule that when teams tell us sunshiny good things, I think you have to be very careful about what's real and what isn't. But when mm-hmm. teams tell us bad news, that's almost right. always 100% accurate. So when everybody say, oh, I'm worried about this injury, I'm concerned, and all that stuff, you have to, that should, perk your ears up and i think this is going to be an extended loss for for the red sox and it's it's a shame i really like this team and they're off to a 13 and 10 start but i, I feel like right now the team is held together by scotch tape and yeah. barbed wire and um you know they, they don't have the depth yeah i think i think their starting team was pretty good the opening 25 they came out with but they don't have the depth to have these kind of injuries and i'm just afraid when that's gonna i mean cutter crawford can't pitch every day and even when cutter right. crawford pitches it's five or six innings and he's out of the game probably not getting a win I, I still think I, I'll, I'll give you one other guy I want you to add in this team. I know it doesn't help you if you lost Casas, but um, I'm relievers are so valuable in fantasy these days, even if they're not closing. And they have this kid, Justin Slayton. Yeah. I, have a, I have a feeling he's going to be closing in the second half of the year. I, the Red Sox are not. I wrote, they, did you write that in the Roto World? Blurb? I wrote that exact thing in yeah. the blurb last night because that was my game. And I just said, look, They've already, the rumors of Kenley Jansen being traded were all preseason, right? Kenley Jansen and Chris Martin are both in the last year of their contracts. If the Red Sox are not contending in the second half of the year, and I think we assumed even fully healthy, they were probably a fringe playoff team, but unlikely playoff team. Now, not healthy Mm -hmm. um, after losing Giolito, Story, Casas for a while, Pavetta, we don't know for how long, Whitlock, we don't know for how long. Like, I think this is a team that's going to be selling in the second half of the year. I would assume that Jansen and Martin are guys that they sell for prospects. And then Slayton is the best arm in their bullpen right now. Um, he was a Rule 5 pick. Um, that the, Red, the, the Mets picked him in the Rule 5 draft, and then the Mets traded him that same day to the Red Sox. Um, and so it's, it's really worked out well for the Red Sox. And so Slayton is somebody I love just for ratios and – as a second half stave stash for sure. One of my favorite, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to steer this podcast off the road, make us talk about Reed Garrett for 50 minutes, but <laughs> I love but you want, but you want to, but I want to, and he's been, he's on a, he just had a great week. He had a, a win, a couple of, sa- I'm sorry, a couple of wins, a save 10 strikeouts. I love these ratio smoothing relievers who mm-hmm. maybe they get the leverage work. Maybe they don't leverage. What does leverage work mean? Because we're, it's not just about the save. For these relievers now, because more wins are getting factored into relief these days, the impact of getting those odd wins from your relievers is much more important than it was in the old days when you know every every team had a tight rotation, guys didn't get hurt as much, they went deeper in games. Even bad pitchers might win 13 to 15 games. Now, like a good pitcher might win 10 or 12, depending on how right. things fall. So if I can get a pitcher in the in the case of of um of Garrett, in in the case of um the Red Sox guy, um, Slayton. Slayton, Slayton, right. If, if I'm just getting the good ratios and occasional shots at a win or a save, yeah, that that's valuable to me. And, and if we see a possibility of a promotion, you know, we were all speculating with Texas. Jose Leclerc looked bad on opening day, and we're all trying to figure out, is it Robertson? Is it Yates? Yeah, it, it's Yates right now. I still think Robertson's value is, is good. I, I'd want him in, in a medium or a deeper league. So uh, we, we're not going to talk about 8,000 million relievers here, but I just want you to constantly be grinding. And, and it's all format dependent. There are some leagues that are mm-hmm. not as valuable as others. I've been in some leagues in NL Tell, for example, Gray Albright drafted a staff of all relief pitchers. Doug Dennis has done that to win AL Tout. And again, you have to play to your room. Maybe it's it's better in a mono league to do that. But, um, you know, whether it's cases picking up Slayton, which I did this week, I've read Garrett's on a bunch of my teams. Um, I, I just want you to, as I've totally steered us away from Casas here, maybe, maybe <laughs> I'm just trying to, to, you know, say something Deflect. positive on a team that looks kind of cursed right now. And, but um, just, there's a lot of value to be had in the bullpen. I want everybody to have that in mind. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Um, and I think the good news for the Red Sox, which we can get to, is that uh, apparently Rafael Devers and Tyler O'Neill are both planning to be back on Tuesday. We will see how that goes. Uh, 
O'Neal had concussion symptoms and was placed on the concussion IL. Devers is dealing with a knee injury, but it's a bone bruise. Um, a name to keep an eye on for the Red uh, And by the way, for Boston, by the way, at least the Bruins and Celtics look great on the weekend. Sure. sure. Um, a name to keep an eye on for the Red Sox. I think uh, Rob Refsnyder is going to play a lot versus lefties at first base. Um and then Nico Cavadas um, is at AAA right now for Boston. He's hitting 286 with four home runs, 10 RBIs. He has a 446 uh, on base percentage and a 1089 OPS. Um, he is a left handed hitter. So there is a chance that they do, you know, they could call up Cavadas. They could uh, have him play mainly against righties at first, and Robbie Ref Schneider could play mainly at lefty against lefties. At first, it's going to be a lot of mixing and matching. You know, Bobby Dahlbeck has the cat with nine lives gets another Pablo Reyes. You know, these are not guys you're really adding outside of the deepest formats. You're crossing your fingers. You're hoping Devers and O'Neill are back and you get those bats in the lineup. Um, and we'll get to Willie Abreu, um, who is somebody that will hit in the waiver wire section, who's another name to know. Yeah, remember that. Fenway's a really good park for left-handed hitters. We've seen that all, you know, Stremsky, Fred Lynn, there's been so many great David Ortiz, so many great examples of that. And I feel like, I don't have any data to back this up, but I feel like platooning has made a major comeback the last few seasons. And mm -hmm. the whole key with platoons is if somebody's on the heavy side of it, you can consider them. If they're on the short side of it, then it becomes a real specialty play. And if you're in a format that allows enough roster maintenance to get those guys in the lineup. And maybe it's more of a DFS thing or something you fool around with props or whatever, but that's, I feel like every team now, Eric, when we, we're always talking about analyzing lineups and analyzing slots and, and all that. I feel like I have to, for one of the first questions I have to ask when I analyze any offense is who are they, who's platooning here? What does the lineup look like against lefties and righties? Because I feel like teams are getting, even though teams don't have, huge benches i mean they every team wants a million you know bottomless cup of pitchers in the bullpen yeah. and, I, and i understand why but yeah I'm, I'm always on those pages like that fangraphs great roster resource page where it shows you really easy to to gauge who's platooning and stuff because that's a huge part of baseball in 24 it, it definitely is it, it for sure is um and it's something everybody needs to keep an eye on um another negative injury is um to Mets catcher Francisco Alvarez, uh, who tore ligaments in his thumb. He kind of stumbled rounding first base and put his thumb down and tore ligaments. We keep hearing this like, oh, he'll, you know, he'll be back in six to eight weeks. Um, I I would not be so sure that I'm on the the far side of this for a couple reasons. One, I think we'll get more once they perform the surgery, we'll get a little more information on what is going on with the ligaments, right? Two, in addition to hitting, it's his catching hand. Okay. The thumb on your catching hand takes a beating all day long, especially when you're catching mid nineties fastballs in order to properly frame a low fastball. You have to get your hand underneath the ball and try to lift it up. So you're getting to the bottom of the strike zone. That means that fastball is basically hitting the thumb bed so that you can get underneath the ball. There's no way Francisco Alvarez is able to catch consistently until that thumb is 100% clear, uh, healthy. He's not. They're not going to put their young cornerstone catcher back receiving and catching until that thumb is fully healed and ready to actually take the beating that it is going to take. I'm looking at at least eight weeks, in my opinion, because the, their timeline right now the, the players are saying six to eight weeks. Remember, this is not the doctors. This is the players mm -hmm. saying six to eight weeks. That's what they've been told. I'm going at least eight weeks. I can't hold him in leagues without an IL spot for eight weeks, possibly 10 weeks. Um, and it sucks to cut a guy like Francisco Alvarez. I had to do it in an NFBC league um, last night because I, I, I just couldn't see holding him for that long. I personally added Patrick Bailey in that league. It was a 12-team, two-catcher league, so it's shallower. And Patrick Bailey is just somebody who is playing every day. Um, we have talked about some other guys that you could roster, um, under 50% rostered in Yahoo leagues. Uh, Ryan Jeffers is playing almost every day because he's DHing a lot for the Twins. Um, the Twins did make a roster move we'll talk about in a second, which could impact that. But Ryan Jeffers, Travis Darno is still under 50% rostered. He is the catcher in Atlanta until Sean Murphy comes back. He had three homers in a game last weekend. He's hitting the ball consistently well. Um, if you want something that could be more long-term, 
Um, Kybert Ruiz with the Nationals is starting a rehab assignment this week, which means he should be back in the Nationals lineup next week um, and will be their everyday starter at catcher. And so he's somebody um, who we were drafting in most leagues as a, as a starting catcher this year. Um, uh, other, it gets it gets dark after this. Uh, Danny Jansen is back. He's a guy you could look at. Um, he's he just two for ten in his first ten games, or his first ten at bats back with the team. Um, Bo Naylor is not playing well, but he's playing often for Cleveland. He's a guy. Um, if you need somebody this week, Elias Diaz um, for the Rockies is just thirty four percent rostered. They get four home games against the Padres, and then they go to Mexico City. And that park last year played so, so, so hitter friendly. Um, so Elias Diaz is going to have a real hitter friendly week. So maybe something like, hey, I'm going to pick up Elias Diaz for this week. And then I pick up Kybert Ruiz for the long term next week could be an interesting move. Um, are you in agreement that in those like no IL leagues, you just have to move on from Alvarez? Yeah, I think you do. And you you hit a key point when you when they say six to eight weeks, you have to hear that is eight weeks. And this is a case where you they say the optimistic stuff and you have to take it with a grain of salt. And remember when Eric's talking about all that, the technical aspect of catching, we're talking about somebody who was a college catcher. So Eric knows from experience what it's like. I, I'm sure you were an excellent pitch framer. I don't know what the metrics say, but I'm sure I, you were, you were still I was actually, right. I was much better at that than blocking. I'll tell you that much. How were you as a hitter? Um, solid. Fine. I, I, I should have been, I should have hit for more power given my frame. I didn't use my lower half properly um and i was a head case and so i who was your who would your mlb who would your mlb comp be uh the way henry davis is hitting right now probably <laughs> henry davis <laughs> awesome awesome also um again this is more of a shallow league play but uh, mitch garver is off to a horrible start but still got a lot, a lot of walks um he's we love catchers who don't catch that's part of the angle for jeffers uh, Garver, I still think, is eventually going to percolate back over 50%, and you have to play to your format, of course. I would not hold off as it, it's two months, and then who knows how quickly he comes back, and maybe they baby him, and then maybe he's just, you know, his swing isn't ready, and it turns out you wait two months for him, and then you feel like you have to play him, and he doesn't hit for mm -hmm. a few more weeks. I, it's no fun for a player in ascending, ascending talent. He had a breakout season last year, and we all know that he has the upside to be like an all-star like a silver slugger, slugger type of guy. I mean, he could be yeah. that good, but um, I cut him. The one the one league where I really needed him, it's like, well, I can't wait. I have other IL problems I have to deal with, which is life in 2024. So right. uh, it was kind of an easy cut, not a fun cut, but kind of an easy cut to make. Yeah, there, there's the easy and fun are separate distinctions there. Sometimes you got to make the moves that are hard. Um, before we get to pitching, there are some good news for hitters. Um, three hitters were activated off the IL either this weekend or today. Just let me know your relative interest in all three of them. The Twins move I mentioned was that this morning, Monday, the Twins activated Max Kepler um, off the IL. So he should uh, go right back into their starting lineup. Um, Trevor Larnock maybe still gets in the starting lineup. Um, we'll see what it does to like Austin Martin's playing time or Jose Miranda, how they move guys around the infield um, and outfield. Nathaniel Lowe. Um, was activated uh, off the IL for the Rangers over the weekend. Um, he has started uh, the first both games um, and hit fifth in the lineup both times for the Rangers. Um, and then Michael Massey, the Royals' second baseman, was activated off the IL over the weekend. Um, he played. He started both games against righties and hit seventh, and then he did, as a left-handed hitter, he did sit on Sunday against a lefty, so Massey is somebody who maybe starts against all right-handed pitching. Um, I have an interest in all three of these guys, depending on the league type. I'm curious if you kind of agree. Yeah, Kepler has been such a tease for me. I, I see that there's certain sort of formats where he would make sense as a pickup. Low, to me, stands ahead of all this mm -hmm. group of three. Career OPS plus of, of 119. Um, best lineup environment right texas is a really i maybe the Royals are better than i think but i mean texas should be a top five offense you, if they finish the year as the top scoring team in the american league it wouldn't surprise me at all and this is where a couple other guys are off to slow starts evan carter hasn't hit at all but he's eventually going to i know they didn't have um seager at the beginning of the season this is i just want pieces of this offense and Lowe's going to hit the slot in the middle of it so he's certainly 
and, and the gold glove defense is also going to keep him in the lineup even if he doesn't hit right away. But uh, he's um, middle of his career too, age 28 mm-hmm. season. Low is my guy. Maybe you can talk me into Massey. I, Kepler, I just feel like we know who Kepler is. He's a high strikeout, high fly ball guy. Those guys have huge slumps. And he's been like almost every Minnesota player. I feel like it's just been a, a struggle to keep him on the field. So I, I've been maybe to my detriment. I've been bitten so many times by that team. I, it yeah. kills me that I drafted a Buxton chair this year. I'm like, why did I do this? Why did I do this? This is, you know, Charlie Brown trying to kick the football and it always gets swiped away with Byron Buxton. I feel a little bit that way about the entire twins offense at times. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you on on low. I will say that I am also a fan of Massey. Um, I, I added him in a couple places where um, Ozzy Albies was placed mm. on the IL um, in the middle of the week. You know, we yeah. talked about Tuesday, that a, a Tuesday of course, before. always yeah. fun, always fun yeah. to get hurt early in the week. Um, Massey, it, you know, he was he was hitting four thirty three in seven games at AAA, hit fifteen homers and stole six bases last year. Um, for the Royals and the majors is 26 years old. I liked a little bit of what he was doing in the spring. Um, I'm not running out to get him, but it was a 15 team league. I needed a second baseman. I, I think Massey fits in a lot of those places. He should play pretty much every day. Um, couple quick uh, pitcher, quick hitters. We'll start with one that I just had to mention because I was drafting him everywhere in the spring and it's DL hall was sent to the IL with a knee injury um, fielding a bunt. Most of you had cut bait on DL hall already. I don't blame you. Um, I do think there's still something here. Um, I don't know if we'll see it this year, whether it comes together for him. It's his first year as a starter. Um, You know, maybe we see it in the summer. Maybe we see it next year. Just, you know, keep an eye on him come June, July, August is all I'll say. Um, The bigger name, Christian Javier, uh, was sent to the IL with a neck injury. Um, So it's the second neck injury IL we've been talking about. Um, We had Yu Darvish with a neck injury. The last time um, he was scratched, uh, Javier was scratched on Sunday. Um, we have no word right now on how long it will last. It is just referred to as neck discomfort at the moment. We don't have any sort of like sprain or strain or anything associated with that. Um, Javier has looked great this year, uh, really leaning into the changeup usage. I think we're just holding him on the IL and hope it's a two-week stint, yes? Yes, although every time I look, at the playoff odds, they they view the Astros as like the favorite or co-favorite in the AL West. I do not and see it, man. I don't get it. I, I think the Rangers are definitely better. I think Seattle's probably better. Um, I, I think this. I don't look. Houston's not seven and sixteen. They're better. They're better than that. They've they've outscored. I think they're they've they've underperformed their Pythagorean. They should be a winning team right now. But the, there's a lot of there's gaps in this lineup, and there's a lot of problems with the starting pitching staff. I I, I think the Astros right now. I think they're less likely to make the playoffs than make it uh yeah i don't know i mean i think they could still sneak in but yes i i i'm not the here's, lineup, the, here's the thing here's the, the lineup I guess. some help and the pitching needs some help they are theoretically going to get luis garcia mm-hmm. framber valdez yeah. lance mccullers back which could help but again we don't we don't know if that's the case here's the recalibration for me is that i'm just because they were good for so long and in deep in the playoffs every year, they went to a bunch of World Series, they won championships. Obviously, there's a huge cheating scandal, but there's so much talent there. They were going to be great no matter what. I think the impact of the whole trash can thing was overblown. It was a bad look and everything, and obviously you had to deal with it. I'm not sure baseball did it the right way, but what whatever. They've been so good for so long. Mm-hmm. And I'm just trying to retrain my brain to not be pet. Oh my God, my pitcher's going up against the Astros. I got to bench him or, oh, yeah. you know, th- my a team I care about or a team I'm interested in otherwise is playing Houston this week. They're going to get swamped. I, I don't feel that way anymore. I, I'm, I'm not saying they're a lousy team, but right now, if anybody wanted to bet me about the Rangers or the Astros, who's going further, I, w- I would bet the Rangers and not even think about it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that on that component. I think the Astros have guys in their lineup like Bregman is not hitting right now. McCormick is not hitting. Abreu is not hitting. Mauricio Dubon is playing pretty regularly and hitting. Eh. I think that of those guys, I think Abreu is done. We've talked about that. I think McCormick will get better. I think Dubon is probably better suited as a bench hitter. I think Bregman gets going. Um, so realistically, I think the Astros have two holes in their lineup. It's Abreu and it's center field. Um now they have some guys like Joey Loprofito who like maybe he makes his call up or his, you know, maybe he comes back. So I, I think there are some paths um, and we will 
we'll see what happens. But no, this is not the the dominant. Doesn't appear to be the dominant Astros team we've seen. And and I get it's hard to look past Alvarez and Tucker because they're so good and they're, they're MVP quality good in the right season. But and you mentioned Abreu, man, he is sunk down to twenty four percent rostered in Yahoo and in a bunch of my leagues, nobody's even touching. You know, we have two week uh, two pickup periods during the week. Nobody's even mm-hmm. touching him, even for the zero bids. Nobody wants him. Yeah, I I, I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, so Javier, Christian Javier on the IL, wait, let's hear what, more about the neck injury, but I think this is just like, we'll, we'll see what happens here, um, with Javier out of the rotation. Uh, we don't yet know who's going to get, um, the call up. It's Verlander, Ronald Blanco, Hunter Brown, JP France right now. Um, I think that, you know, you might be looking at like Blair Henley, who got a, a spot start before, maybe gets a start. It's not going to be anything you're anybody you're running um, to pick up, basically. Uh, Merrill Kelly was scratched from his start. Um, he went for an MRI. We have no news yet on the results of that MRI. Um, it's a little more concerning than the Christian Javier situation because uh, he had shoulder discomfort. Uh, shoulder discomfort. You know, I, I talked about my you know my buddy who worked. In a for a, in a who works in an organization who mentioned that they are far more comfortable with elbow injuries than shoulder injuries and back injuries. Um, so shoulder is a concern right now. I would expect Kelly to be down for a few weeks, um, not a minor turn in the rotation. Um, mm-hmm. So I think you hold him as long as you can, but Merrill Kelly is not somebody, even though I like him, to me he's not somebody where if I'm in a crunch um, in the IL in IL spots, I feel like I have to hold him. If you're in like 15 team leagues, deep leagues, obviously, but in a normal 12 team league, um, I think that you are okay moving on. If we hear that he's going to be out for like multiple months, if he's out for just a couple turns in the rotation, hold on. Um, and then I, I don't really see anything, anybody replacing him right now. Clay Ciccone got the start. Um, Hopefully Ryan Nelson is back off the IL soon. He just had a, an elbow bruise because he got hit with a comebacker. Um, and then the other name I would tell people to watch um, is uh, Christian Mena, who uh, they got from the White Sox um, in February. He is now, he's a 21 year old. He's in AAA. Um, he has a 332 ERA across four AAA starts, 21 strikeouts in 19 innings. Um, could be an interesting name if they if they promote him. Otherwise, like Tommy Henry, Slade Ciccone, I'm not really invested in. It's funny how a lot of things went right for them in the playoffs last year. They got to 92, eight, just 83 wins, but they got to the World Series. And now this year, guys getting hurt, guys underperforming. And it's a really hard division. There's nowhere to hide in that division. Obviously, Colorado's horrible, but the other four teams are all trying, and, and the Dodgers trying harder than anybody. I feel like it almost feels like they some some good luck tax is coming due for the Cardinals, for the Cardinals, for the Diamondbacks this year. Yeah, unfor- unfortunately so. Um, last two moves are two demotions, and I just want to know if you're giving up on both these guys. Um, Victor Scott got demoted over the weekend. Um, we talked about him a lot and his speed when he was called up. And then just like two minutes ago, uh, Louis Varland got demoted by the Twins. We kind of expected it. He had been pitching pretty terribly um, through four starts. Are you out on both of these guys? Or if they get opportunities again in June, July, August, would you would you consider going back in? You have to be out right now. It's, it's something you'll reevaluate when they come up. How well do they perform in the minors? what the situation is with the team, how lengthy the trial may be. When you said you had breaking news of a fresh demotion, I was afraid it was going to be Jackson Holiday. although um, we'll talk about him a little bit later, but maybe, maybe he should be demoted the way he's playing. He just looks overmatched at the moment. But yeah, you have to, Varland and, and Victor Scott are easy cuts. Yeah, I, I still, I am interested in Victor Scott if he comes back up again later. Um, I see a... 20 how was he 23 a 23 year old who skipped triple a who did not hit the major league level i think we, it's pretty clear like he was not ready however 23 percent strikeout rate just a 10 percent swinging strike rate um he had a 87 percent zone contact rate uh sorry 88 percent zone contact rate this is not a guy who was overmatched in terms of swing and miss it's a guy who wasn't able to make contact with any authority 
off of major league pitching. We had seen him continue to get a little bit better at like driving the gaps as he got up in the minors and then went to the Arizona Fall League. He's still somebody who I believe can hit major league pitching in, in his future and has the speed to be a real difference maker. So he's going to go down to AAA for the first time. Again, he's never been at AAA. He's going to get a couple months down there. He's somebody who I think we could see up again in like July and August and is somebody that I think really could help people who need steals in the second half of the year because I, I was at least intrigued by the fact that he wasn't getting blown away. He's not ready, but I don't know that he won't be ready. Like just pure won't be ready. Totally reasonable. And even, even though it's early, the Cardinals are in last place in that division. They were finished last place last year. I would not be surprised if they did a partial teardown in the middle of the season. And then it becomes, okay, let's see what our young players can do. Let's try to develop them. And maybe they just say at some point, they just say in the second half, okay, Victor Scott's playing the rest of the year. I don't, I don't care if he hits 178. Yeah. He's playing. We're going to give him a chance to, as you said, the AAA experience will be good for him. He did skip that level initially, so I I want you to cut him, but I want you yes. to be I want I want you to keep that phone ready. To, I want you to beat everybody to the punch, and, and thankfully, it probably won't cost you a lot when he does come back up, and right. he will come back up. I want you to be op- open minded when that happens. And I don't care how much you spent on him, cut him, right? I spent triple yeah. digits in an NFBC, uh, you know, online championship to get him. I moved doesn't on. Doesn't matter. It's a sunk. It doesn't cost. matter. Yeah, you're you're not holding. You're not holding on him at this point. Um, we're gonna get to some guys you should be holding on to or picking up. Uh, but before we do that, the NFL draft kicks off on Thursday, and we have you covered with our mock drafts, positional rankings, player interviews, news updates all around the league. Go to NBCSports.com/slash NFL Draft today for insight leading into round one and check back throughout the draft for analysis on every pick. If you go to NBCSports.com slash NFL Draft or you go to our YouTube page, uh, you'll see Connor Rogers and I broke down every single position, player previews for every single position. Connor does tremendous work scouting all these positions. So so you can look at guys that you need to know for the first round. And then we had a video just on like day three guys that you need to know, covering every position for day three guys. So that's something to check out. Connor. Roto Pat and I will be um, on the YouTube channel on Saturday night going over some key um, day three picks. All the guys from Fantasy Football Happy Hour will be going Mm -hmm. over the stuff on Saturday of just like fantasy impacts for these picks. So we've got you covered both from a real just NFL draft, NFL team perspective, and also fantasy perspective. So make sure you check that out um, over on the NBC Sports YouTube page and on NBCSports.com slash NFL draft. I'm sure what you a guys dream. have stuff at What Yahoo a dream well. team, man. What a dream team. You have so much NFL talent over there. And um it's man, great. It, it feels like the run up to this draft has been like eight months, but it's Forever. finally it's finally here. Yeah. And we know it's a critical NFL draft with all the quarterbacks who are gonna go early, all the receivers who are gonna go early. And then even though the running backs won't go as early, there are a lot of teams that are screaming for a running back. Dallas Cowboys are one of those teams. So you're gonna have a lot to talk about, and I'll, I'm certainly gonna check out all that content. Yeah, it, it should be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm also looking forward to talking about some of the most added mm-hmm. uh, hitters and pitchers across Yahoo Leagues uh, also, and just some guys that we wanted to highlight who had really good weekends. Um, you alluded to somebody who I tweeted about as well, uh, which is the national second baseman Luis Garcia Jr., um, who was, I think he was like the eighth most added hitter in Yahoo formats. Um, so this isn't like one of the top guys, but I wanted to bring him up because you kind of already mentioned him before. This is the 23-year-old. He made his MLB MLB debut at 20 years old. So this is a guy that I think we wrote off really early. He is currently hitting 317 in 19 games with one home run, 10 RBIs, five steals. Uh, he stole nine bases in all of last year. He already has five steals on the year. He has been, not been caught stealing at all. Um, he has just a 16% strikeout rate. He is a free swinger. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. This is a guy with a 38% chase rate, but he has a 91% zone contact rate. He only 10% swinging strike rate. He makes a lot of contact. He has good speed. I don't think he's going to hit for a ton of power, but I could easily see him ending the year with 15 steals and a solid batting average hitting in the middle of that lineup. Um, and so I've added him in a lot of places. I know you're interested as well. I don't know that he's 12 team relevant unless like you're really hampered by like an Ozzy Albi situation or you really need speed. But I, I really like grabbing Luis Garcia. Me too. You know, sometimes 
losing teams. It seems like they have this yellow approach on this on the stolen bases. Like just okay, let's just run like crazy. Let's make that what we are. We're seeing the Angels do it right now, too. right? Yeah, we, Angels do. It. I mean, Lane Thomas right now can't hit a thing. His OPS plus is forty three, but he's stolen ten bases every time he yeah. gets on base. He's been caught another time. Uh, I think eventually, I know Abrams only has four, but he's 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 too good not to steal forty or fifty. Garcia's running has popped. Even Jacob Young, who isn't really a regular, whenever he's playing, he's, he's already got up to six stolen bases. Unfortunately, he doesn't play enough or hit enough to really become. Mm-hmm. Fantasy violent, a uh, fantasy violent, fantasy relevant. Or, he's you know, violent for your fantasy team. Yeah, he he, he can be violent on the basis. He's, not, <laughs> he's just not violent enough when he hits. But yeah. I, I just think about like I remember when Jonathan VR had a couple of seasons of relevance, and people are like, "Oh, yeah, he's not really that good, and he swings at anything." And I was like, "I don't care. I just want the numbers. I just want this is a guy who's going to go twenty forty, and I'm I'm in for it." And I know a lot of people don't think Lane Thomas is that great of a player, and and the way he's hitting so far, they're looking validated so far but he's running every time he gets on base garcia right. good lineup real estate they're going to get ruiz back so I, I think this is a team jesse winker was a popular pickup this yeah. week i don't think this team is good one to nine but like one to like six i'm kind of interested i they even have some pitchers we're, we're interested in now and it's not just mackenzie gore we'll get to somebody in a minute so i feel like this yeah. is a frisky little team i feel like there's more People yes. looked at this team and said, oh, yeah, if I don't get C.J. Abrams, who cares? I don't want anybody else here. I'm not going to be the sucker with Lane Thomas. You know, I'll wait a year on Mackenzie Gore. We'll figure out who their closer is. And they even have two relievers who are, who are throwing lights out right now. So mm-hmm. the Washington Nationals, I know how it's going to end. Um, sorry, Producer Adam. They're going to win like 72 games. <laughs> but there's fan. this is a team that has some – I think they're underserved, underrepresented in the fantasy market, and Garcia is a part of that. And I, I'm glad that you brought up – um that you don't really care so much about like what his swing profile is. I think Mm -hmm. it's important also to understand the type of hitter we're talking about, right? So this is a guy who chases outside of the zone a lot, but he makes a lot of contact. He is not a power hitter. So I don't care as much because if somebody's chasing out of the zone, but making contact, they're probably not making con- unless you're unless you're Vladimir Guerrero Senior who was hitting home runs off balls that bounced, right? You're not really making meaningful authoritative contact if you're consistently chasing out of the zone. So if I see a power hitter who's consistently swinging outside of the zone but making a lot of contact, I don't love it because I think that's going to limit how much meaningful, powerful contact he makes. If I see a, a contact hitter who has good speed who's swinging a lot outside of the zone but making a lot of contact outside of the zone i don't i don't it's not something i'm like running to scoop up hitters like that but also that's a profile that could still hit singles and if that's a profile that still hits singles that's a profile that still gets me an okay batting average and good stolen bases so i don't run from high chase rates when i'm also seeing high contact rates both in the zone and outside of the zone if I'm looking for a batting average or a speed first player. And that's what Luis Garcia is. That's such a great point. Like you'll see sometimes a player will have a really low line drive rate, but it's a player whose game is mostly speed. And it's like, okay, that's actually good for for some, it's not a lot of players, but for some players just getting the ball in play and it doesn't have to be hit hard is good for them because they run mm-hmm. so fast and they get a lot of infield hits out of it or they get opposite field hits because you're not looking again, the power isn't the thing with those types of players. It's not a common player trope but it does show up enough and you have to be open-minded to where this outliers show up and i think you make a great point that garcia may be one of those guys yeah and just to, to highlight you did mention jesse winker uh 328 batting average so far uh two home runs uh 13 runs scored nine rbis two steals he is somebody we saw hit for a solid batting average and okay power when he was in cincinnati that dried up in seattle and then he was playing mm-hmm. through injuries in milwaukee um he's 30 years old now you're not getting some like crazy breakthrough but we have to remember that just like three years ago jesse winker was a very competent hitter in terms of good understanding of the strike zone made a lot of contact he's still that same hitter good understanding of the strike zone making contact i don't know that you're getting 24 homers like you did in 2021 but he i think could be a solid deep league outfielder hitting in the top half of this lineup I blew it because I loved him last year. And as you said, injuries explain most of the season away, but I just kind of thought, okay, maybe the winker thing is gone and I'll just give up on it. And, and so I was late to add him where I I chose, I chose Rosario, him and Eddie Rosario Mm -hmm. were basically signed at the same time. And I had more belief in Rosario. And so in some like draft and hold leagues, I took Rosario and it's been winker. Um, And, you know, again, he, he's probably not in their outfield over the summer. Because if he keeps hitting like this, they'll unload him to somebody yeah. and they'll bring up, you know, their prospects. 
but he's he's going to be useful for the next few months. Um, another outfielder who we alluded to earlier on uh, was William Abreu, the 24-year-old um, who made his debut with the Red Sox last year, who is now back up and in an ev- pretty much an everyday spot in their lineup. Alex Cora did say he will play every day against righties, so he may sit versus some lefties. Um, he's hitting 280 on the season with one home run, nine runs scored, seven RBIs, and four steals. He started off a little rough in terms of batting average, but he's eight for his last 23 over his last five games. Um, You know, the four steals in just 18 games is good to see. He is somebody who also chases a lot outside of the zone, doesn't make as much contact as Luis Garcia, so I think that batting average is not going to be 280 for a while. You might be looking more at like a 240 or 250, but he had 22 home runs. And stole eight bases in AAA for Boston last year in just 86 games. He has some power. He has a little bit of speed. I think that he's going to be relevant in a, in a lot of formats. Um, and we know that even fully healthy, he was playing every day versus right-handed pitching. So without Casas, it's not like he's going to lose playing time. He is still, you know, if they go left-hand, if they face a lot of lefties in a week, you may have to sit him. But otherwise, he's going to be in that lineup and hitting or like fifth or sixth, basically. Yeah, he's had an interesting profile, right? I mean, the great walk rate right now is expected batting average. Even though he's hitting 280, his expected batting average is actually under 200, which is really difficult to do. And he doesn't have bad, like his exit velocity is fine. His battle rate is fine. His hard hit rate is around league average. Bottom line is this. He has playing time. He has a broad set of skills. And I I, I don't think, I, I think he's got enough leash here where he they're going to, ride it out with Abreu. So I, I with the park thrown in, he's somebody I'm interested in. It's just his sliders are all over the place. I, I like to see, and, and, and maybe sometimes when you look at these p- pages, right, we're just looking for some clarity. We're looking for explanations. And sometimes there just aren't, sometimes stats just contradict each other or they conflict or they just mm-hmm. have, we haven't gotten enough. We always talk about what stabilizes early. A lot of stuff doesn't, and we have to wait and it won't right now. We're just making a guess on what something means. We won't really know what it means until we get more data. Unfortunately to play fantasy, right? You have to react to partial data. And sometimes you're just really taking a guess on tiny samples. That's what fantasy baseball in April is all about. But I admit when I look at this profile, I'm like, man, I feel like you could tell, you can choose your own adventure with a brave. Right. You go in so many different directions. And sometimes you overreact to tiny samples. Um, and that was why about a week ago, Dalton Varsho found himself mm-hmm. under 40% rostered in Yahoo leagues. A lot of people will, were fully out on him. Uh, he has five home runs over the last seven games. Um, he has a, a really solid weekend, but really the last week um, has been really good for him. He has upped his season line. He's hitting 242 with five home runs, 14 runs, 11 RBIs, two steals. This is the case of us overreacting um, early on. He's somebody who we know underwent a swing change in the offseason. It looked good in the spring. It's not always sunshine and rainbows and consistent production when you're going through a swing change. And so he struggled a little bit out of the gates. Um, You know, the power is nice to see. We knew he always kind of had some power. Two stolen bases, fine. Like, you know, maybe he gets to that 16 range he got to last year. I don't think this is like a decidedly new Dalton Varsho, but I think this is the Dalton Varsho we thought would hit 240 with 20 plus home runs and 15 plus stolen bases. And we, people were cutting him too early. Yeah. Another case of you need to recalibrate. He came up as a catcher. He's not catcher eligible anymore. And because he was so disappointing last year, I think a lot of people washed him out. You said, okay, I'm, I'm done with that. This guy isn't as good as I thought he was. Maybe Arizona is going to win that trade. They get Montero who's a good looking catcher, but I mean, even in a bad season, he had 20 home runs and 16 stolen bases. And I was interested to see how the swing change would, would play. The slugging's been there. The other slash stats aren't there. I don't really know. Your Toronto, Eric, two or three years ago, I thought this was going to be like the lineup I was in love with for 10 years. And I don't know what happened to that group. It's, and yeah. we talked a little bit about Vladimir Guerrero last week about he's obviously good, but is he going to be like tear up the world good or just another good player? I'm still not really sure about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bo Bichette's a little bit like that. He, we know he's a good player. Is he a great player? But and the changes to the ballpark last year, I thought it would help offense. It turns out that the park played more as a pitcher's park. That's one year of sample. There can be noise and data like that. Bottom line, I think it's, I think I under, I think my general takeaway on our show is what you seem to be implying is that I think there's an underappreciated player here. He's still just age 27 season. 
I'd be by. I, it's easy to say this. He just had a good week, but I, I think he's trending upward. I think his whatever you currently think of our show, I think you'll think higher of him in like two months. Yeah, I will say I, I don't think you need to use this as a sell high, right? This isn't like oh, this is a hot week. Get him off your roster. Sure, if somebody wants to overpay for a five homer week, go for it. Mm-hmm. But I think this is going to be a solid guy i don't think you should expect him to hit more than 240 or 250 but i think the rest of the stuff is going to play and so i wouldn't be actively looking to get out from underneath him um a little bit in the way that i might for the next guy one of the biggest pickups for this week um was brian de la cruz uh of the marlins over the last five games he's five for 19 with three home runs and five rbis he has five homers on the season uh, 10 runs scored, 14 RBIs, a 20, uh, 274 average. This is a guy with a 20, uh, 28% strikeout rate and a 3% walk rate. Mm-hmm. He barrels the ball a bunch. Um, he swings out of the zone a decent amount. He has just a 74% zone contact, or sorry, a 60, sorry, 74% zone contact rate, a 67% contact rate overall that is well below average. Um, with the strikeout rate also being a concern. I Brian De La Cruz can hit for power. Not a question. He is hitting second in the Marlins lineup every day. I don't think you're actively trying to get away from him. I tried to get him in a couple places. Have no problem with people picking him up this week. He's swinging a hot bat right now. But, but I don't necessarily think that this is the beginning of a breakout. I don't love what we're seeing in terms of his swing decisions. And I think... This is uh, a little bit of an all or nothing power profile without really any speed. Yeah, to talk about the poor man's daily cruise, right? I mean, a lot of swing and miss, but when he does make contact, it's explosive. I'm encouraged by the jump and slugging because last year, you know, he only slugged 411. It's like, well, man, for a guy who swings from his heels, I'd like to see more happen when you actually hit the ball. This year, the slugging has spiked. And whenever people have picked up Dale Cruz because he was a pickup middle of last season and people wrote him out for the rest of the year, it's like, well, he plays every day. I know the lineup isn't great, but he's in the middle of it. So you can get volume here. You're, you're gonna He's going to project to have over 600 plate appearances again, assuming he stays healthy. They're not jerking him around. They're not platooning mm-hmm. him. So he's. I think he's quietly, and as you mentioned, he percolated higher up in the lineup this year, although Miami, man, is that team kind of a depressing team right now, but – Anytime it's always in a mixed league, Eric, we want the most volume. We want the most at bats. We want the most plate appearances. And that's a little bit of a survivor bias because if you had players who weren't good, they wouldn't bat first or second or third. They would bat eighth or ninth. They'd be in platoons. They'd get sent down, all that stuff. But playing time at bats, volume, that's a a way to fantasy success in a mixed league. I I think Dela Cruz is probably a better fantasy player than real life player right now, but because of his real estate, because the slugging has trended upward, I can. I wasn't. He was the most added player over the weekend in a lot of formats, and I, I don't like him. I'm not two hands in on De La Cruz, but I think he's certainly worthy of a pickup. And I think he'll, sure. just be more, he'll be one of those quiet. The season will end, and be like, oh yeah, De La Cruz. He was like outfielder 43 or 44. He was useful. It, you won nothing having him, right. but you were better off rostering him than somebody else. It wouldn't surprise me if he's a guy who's on and off a lot of rosters, but basically mm-hmm. on somebody's roster for for the entire season. And maybe you're picking wrong and week after week, right? You don't get him. Right. He, he drives exactly. 13 runs. You don't play him. You play him the next week. He gets three hits. Yeah. It's just part of the game. Uh, The last most rostered or most added hitter uh, this week was Ahmed Rosario. Mm -hmm. Um, He's somebody who it seemed like the Rays were going to use only against lefties at the start of the year. Um, A lot of the injuries, um, in particular in the outfield, opened up extra bats for him. He's playing a lot of right field and or second base. Um, And he's been really good over over the last little while. But over the last five games in particular, he's nine for 20 with one home run, five RBIs, two steals. Um, This is somebody we've seen have fantasy relevance in the past. Uh, I would just caution people that Josh Lowe is starting a rehab assignment. Um, Josh Lowe is going to play right field every day against um, right-handed pitching. Um, So that could take away some of Ahmed Rosario's at-bats versus right-handed pitching in a few weeks. Though, you know, Harold Ramirez is DHing right now, not playing great. Um, you know, they, Brandon Lau is on the IL. So there's extra second base opportunities for Ahmed Rosario. So I don't know how long this lasts, but I have no problem picking up Rosario because I still think the lineup is not extraordinary, but fine. And we've seen him be a serviceable fantasy player before. And I think as long as you're saying, Hey, I don't know how this is going to last, but I'll ride it while it's going. I I think Rosario is a solid 
bet with some multi-position eligibility. You must have written the note on him because it's almost exactly everything you wrote. You know, <laughs> <I did. laughs> you know what? You know what, Roto World? I, you guys, I don't see any reason why the people who write the notes shouldn't have their initials at the end of it. Now, granted, I, I've read enough of your notes now that I can tell when it's you. But one thing I really like is that. It, a lot of times when a, when the player had a good game, whatever, you write about it and, and you just kind of get in and get out. But you're always trying to give the global overview of the player. And you, and you talked about what would, what do we expect from Rosario before the season? It's kind of different now. We didn't see him as a full-timer. Right now he is a full-timer. And isn't he – haven't we seen this classic – this is like the Ben Zobris model, not that Rosario is as good as Zobris was at peak, but multiple positions – Broad set of skills. Players like that are always generally underrated. Bill James told us that. I don't know the staying power of Rosario, but I was making aggressive bids. I was competitively bidding for him this weekend, and I'm glad I got some shares. Yeah, uh, I I was bidding. I have him in a few places. Um, again, like him and De La Cruz are the types of hitters. You need to make some of those ads, too, where you're like, I don't know how long this guy's going to stay, but he's working for me right now, and I'm happy to do and, it. And that's the thing, right? I know it's so trendy to say I play with my hair on fire. I play for upside. I'm hitting home runs. You get it. You get to mix in a couple of singles and doubles. Sometimes right. it's great to throw 70 yard touchdown passes. Sometimes you get to throw a nine yard pass and get to the new first down. Yes. That's what a modern oh, Rosario is. He's a, he's a chain mover, right? He's going to be that receiver who catches 72 passes for 745 yards and five touchdowns. And you know what? There's a, there's a place for those guys. The home runs that people think they're getting are on some of these closer bids, uh, which mm. we've seen. You already talked about Kirby Yates, who's one of the most added players in Yahoo over the weekend. Um, it does seem like he's going to get the a lot of the saves. Um, they're using David Robertson in a lot of high leverage situations, um, which has left the ninth inning to Kirby Yates. I don't know that it will exclusively be Kirby Yates, um, but it's easy to see why they both should be on your rosters. Um, maybe Robertson gets more sneaky bullpen wins than than saves um we don't know how long this will last for yates he's been really hurt over the over the last few years so robertson could be the fallback there but i, I think they both seem viable in fantasy leagues. for sure they're older guys so you have to be careful with that but bottom line when you're betting on team infrastructure winning team defending world champs i i still think this year they're a 90 plus win team i think they're the best team in that division we like Brees bochi as a manager that's what you want to do. I'm not saying you could never roster these really like closers or, or even non closers on losing teams, but you're just going to get your mileage is going to go so much further when they're a winning team. And obviously that's yeah. what Texas is. So I'll, I'll certainly sign off on Yates, but I think even in the deeper leagues, Robertson is interesting too. Um, there might be a closer change for another winning team because um, Advert Alzale has blown, I think it's already four saves this mm -hmm. year. He's not looking good. Um, Hector Neris has locked down the last uh, save and then got that Sunday uh, fab boost of some really, really crazy high uh, bids. Neris had a really tough start to the season, um, but has looked better of late. He's somebody who, though, has consistently struggled to like hold down a closer's job. We've seen him look really good for stretches. We've seen him go on bad stretches and, and lose the gig. Um, are you assuming this is it for Alzale? He's out of the closer's role. Are you assuming Neris is the closer? Do you think this is a situation in flux? How are you kind of approaching this? Yeah, well, Kirk Council called it day-to-day -day on Sunday, and Mark Leiter's here. Mm -hmm. Alzale, yeah. you know, they're not going to bury him. It's, it's going to be a case where what Neris does in his first few chances is going to go a long way because what teams – in every sport, when teams when teams find a easy button to push, they'll keep pushing it. So, if if Neris can get off to a fast start as the temporary, you know, head of the committee right now, it'd just be easy to say, okay, well, this is working. We're going to stick with it. And maybe they like maybe Azale gets going in the middle relief. I mean, it's, it's not like he's going to get cut or or get you know thrown out of the the um, rotation here. It's just a matter of he just may pitch in different spots and. There's always going to be teams now more than ever understand leverage and understand, you know, sometimes the game's critical in the, it's in the balance in the sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning. We saw that with the Mets this week where they had a Diaz pitched in the eighth inning that set up Garrett to get that save because they used their better reliever in the eighth inning because the Dodgers main part of the lineup yeah. was up. That, that's smart managing, right? And we've seen, I mean, Eric, we grew up with teams that would manage to the win and manage to the save. You, know, you have to keep your starter in for five and let him get that win. And you had to 
save your closer for the ninth inning. He was a seven, eight, nine guys. And it just made no sense. Teams don't right. do that anymore, but council, he's one of my favorite managers. I think he's proactive. I think he's smart. I think he's reasonable, but also when he talks about it, when somebody in Chicago is a tough media town, he answers the question. It'd be very easy to, to give us some BS answer and make us kind of guess on stuff. But I thought he handled it pretty openly and I respect that. That said, I'm seeing Alzale dropped in some of my leagues, and I can see I can understand that. And I yeah. I'm probably not going to be picking up the crumbs on that. I'm probably just going to let him stay on the wire. I think I could see letting him stay on the wire for for a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if he works himself back into mm -hmm. a, a situation in at the end of the year or you know over the summer. Um, I think as you mentioned, lighter could work in there. I think it's a similarly muddied situation for Craig Council's old team, mm -hmm. um, where Joel Piamps was the big pickup. Um, but I just want to caution that like Trevor McGill came off the IL with a from the concussion and he was tasked on Saturday night with like immediately trying to get a two out a two inning save um and he looked really good and then he just kind of like he let two he let two guys on base with two outs in the second inning you know tired obviously throwing 30 pitches in his first game back off the IL um, and so he couldn't cement the two inning save. And then he was unavailable on Sunday because he had just thrown um, 30 pitches. He was somebody who was pitching the highest leverage situation, get, situations against the Mets in the first series. When Abner Uribe was getting the saves, McGill was used twice to face Lindor and Alonzo. And because it was in the seventh inning, people said, oh, McGill, he's not closing. I think McGill is is really obviously trusted by Pat Murphy in Milwaukee. I think he's going to be used in high leverage situations. I think he's going to be in this mix. I don't think it's just Joel Piamps. I think they can both be rostered, but I saw a lot of people not bidding on McGill or even dropping McGill. And I would just say if McGill's on your wire, I'd be adding him as well. Especially because you love when you can get in at the lowest acquisition cost. He's somebody you can get for a zero bid. Somebody you can get for that first come first serve period that a lot of teams have after the offers get processed. I love being able to shop in that secondary market. And what a fun team, by the way, Milwaukee, 14 and six. I think they have the, they're the second best offense by efficiency right now. Only Atlanta is ahead of Milwaukee. And in a year where look at everything they've lost, they lost their manager. They lost their basic roster architect. They lost their number one starter. Even right now, Yelich is hurt, which is a kick in the gut because he was off to a great start. But Contreras has been great. The pitching has been – I still don't know how deep it really is, but Peralta's off to a good start. Ray's off to a good start. Some of these bullpen guys are interesting. Hopefully they get Williams back. I don't know how optimistic you are on Williams off the major back problems, and back fracture, right, if he'll be ready to go in the middle of the season. But I, I mean, I, I have him in a couple of places yeah, where I, do too. I, I figured that he was a stash. So I'm, I'm interested for sure. Well, what you're looking for, if you, if you stashed him, the last thing you wanted is them to get off to a six and 14 start where it's like, okay, right. let's not rush them back. The season's in the tank. You love that they're competitive because then it becomes, okay, let's get, let's get this going here. We can maybe get into the playoffs. And we know we saw it last year more than any year, right? Recently that you get into the playoffs. You, all you need is a seat at that table, a chip in a chair and you get a chance. Arizona was mm -hmm. not a great team last year. They made it to the world series. And, you know, I don't think anybody really saw Texas coming either. They were a good team, but not a great team. So Milwaukee, right. I'm in on these guys. I might like Piomps a just a little bit more than you, and I'm I'm down on your rebate, but they're going to mix and match, and there's no reason my McGill can't get in this mix too. I I think by All Star break, it's going to be a case where like one of these guys will have 11 saves, one of these guys will have six saves, and one of these guys will have three or four saves. I I fully agree on all of that. Um, we're going to get to the three most added pitcher, starting pitchers, and then Scott and I are going to tell you a couple guys that we're actually really concerned about. But before we do that, um, the next stop on the, Indi in the IndyCar series is Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama. The green flag waves at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time only on NBC and Peacock. Uh, that's the IndyCar series at Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama on Sunday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on NBC and Peacock. Um, so the three most added starting pitchers, um, I look for guys who were added, not just because like, Hey, they have a start on Monday. So people added them on Sunday night. Um, but they were Mitchell Parker of the nationals, Albert Suarez of the Orioles and Jose Soriano of the angels. 
Um, I'm curious. I'll give my thoughts on these guys, but I'm curious if any of these three pitchers jumped out to you as somebody you you had to add. Mitchell Parker, interesting to me, former prospect, um, the strikeouts and walks lineup. Uh, he was the guy who I was getting aggressive bids on. I didn't win all of them, but he was kind of my target this week. And I mean, listen, two really good starts against the Dodgers and the Astros. So it's hard to, you know, you don't, you definitely don't look away from that when they faces those opponents. Um, he's somebody who has two, he has a three pitch arsenal, only two pitches grade out above average. Uh, the curveball grades out as his best pitch. Um, it is. It has been a really good pitch for him so far this year. Missing a lot of bats. He throws it in the zone a lot. The fastball, to me, your belief in Mitchell Parker depends on your belief in can he continue to get away with a 92-mile-an-hour fastball because it has good extension and he has really good induced vertical break on it, um, which allows it to play up maybe more than it should based on its VLO. I know Lance Brozdowski referred to it as like a Shota Imanaga light sort of four seam fastball. If you believe that the fastball can succeed without poor velocity, without good velocity, then he's got a decent breaking pitch to go along with it. If you believe that that fastball is going to eventually be hit, then that really kind of narrows his usage. But I think he's certainly worth looking at for now like I, I i was i was looking to add him because he also gets a pretty good matchup um in the next week out and i'll oh man who is it i'll have to look it up but he gets oh he gets the marlins next mm -hmm. and so if you look that good against the astros and the dodgers i can play you against the marlins for sure and then we'll see how much i buy the other stuff yeah so it looks like um at miami and then at Texas, that'll be a challenge. But um, also the past pedigree here too, right? The, the book on him was that he had really good stuff. He just, the control wasn't there. And that's one of those things. And it, you can't teach somebody really, usually you can't teach somebody that to miss bats if they can, or to have, you know, eye dropping velocity if they don't, you know, I know guys mm -hmm. got to go to drive line, they can improve it. But the things that he was good at already or made him an interesting prospect are the stuff that you have to have right away out of the box. We can figure out the control. Yeah. Um, Albert Suarez is a guy who was interesting. The Orioles called him up. He looked great in his first game. He is a 30 year old who's bounced around. He went to the KBO um, 34 year old. Sorry. Went to the KBO. Um, I, you know, the fastball has never been as good as it looked in that first start. Um, it grades out below average. It gets a decent amount of, of horizontal movement. So even though it doesn't, it's like 96. Uh, the cutter is a really good pitch and grades out really well and misses bats and all of that. Um, I don't know, man. Like it, he has no options left. So they called him up. So they, he's going to stick in the rotation or the bullpen until they decide to cut him or trade him. So he's going to get an opportunity. He gets the angels. I believe this week, I'm happy to add him and see how it goes. I don't think this is like another breakout. No, I, I don't either. Uh, I think he actually might get Oakland this week, which would be really good, but Oh, I'm sorry. Is it a two start? Is he? Is he get? Okay, he gets. He gets the Angels on Monday, and then he maybe if he's still in the rotation, he'll get Oakland on the weekend. It sounds like they're going to get a, some reinforcements in this rotation soon. Uh, they mm -hmm. may get Means back. Hopefully, Cal Bradish back. Although, with whenever it's like rehab over surgery, you always right. wonder if that other cleat is going to drop. But y you're right. A 34 year old journeyman. I know he's out of options, which usually would protect the player. But I don't think the Orioles view him as a long term solution. And if they have to cut him eventually when things just the roster glut falls that way, I think Suarez is going to be, unfortunately, some of the they, they risk exposing to the rest of the league. Maybe he'll get picked up and maybe he won't. Maybe he'll just get slid back to the minors. But I can see Adam this week because the matchups are good. Yes. I don't think sure. I don't think there's any staying power. Yes, I think the matchups are, are really good. If he does get both those starts, it's an incredible two-start week, especially because with his team, um, he's probably going to get two wins from that. The last guy is the guy I might be most interested in, which is Jose Sor uh, Soriano from the Angels. Um, he is a 25-year-old who has looked really good through through two starts, um, but much like Mitchell Parker, doesn't have like a really strong swinging strike rate overall, just 11.5%. Um, his strikeout rate uh, of 25% is a little bit below average, um, but he's somebody, he leads with a, a really good knuckle curve. 
Um, and he's somebody who I think um, his pitches all move a lot and he's a former reliever. I don't think he's going to go really deep into games, maybe five innings. Um, he doesn't find the zone a ton, but he has some con- control issues, but his pitches move so much that I, hitters have a really tough time squaring him up. If he was on a better team, he'd be a better fantasy asset because I think he might only go five innings and you're going to not steal that many wins on the Angels. But he's somebody I think is interesting, like five innings, one to two runs at a time with with five strikeouts, not a lot of hits. Like I think that that could be the type of guy he is. For sure. You follow the strikeouts, follow, follow the swings and misses. Again, he's enough control. It just It's going to be a lot of four and five inning starts for him. I feel like you have like almost no win equity, but – at least the strikeouts present a plausible upside. Yeah, it, it's just somebody to to keep in mind in deeper formats. Um, real quick, because we are running out of time, um, we're just going to hit the, we each have a couple players that we have legitimate concern over, not necessarily um, guys to drop, but just guys we are concerned about. So who are the guys you're concerned about? I hate saying this, but Jackson Holiday just, he looks over match. He's 20 years old. It's to be expected, but the walk strikeout rate, I mean, he's having trouble. He's swinging out of the zone more than I thought. And he's batting ninth. They're so loaded there that even if mm-hmm. he starts to get it going, he's not going to be hitting third. I, you know, the, the team, it's amazing how talented this team is. I think eventually they're going to say, well, we don't, we're putting too much pressure on the kid. Go, go down and, and, you know, kick the crap out of triple A pitching again. I, I don't think they're going to let him struggle this much longer because they don't want him to, to have his confidence get wrecked. But, even the I'm just thinking the upside may not be what we it's it's hard when the best player and the best prospect in baseball gets called up you want to think and I'm usually not a prospect guy in the sense that I don't expect miracles right away baseball's hard there's a list of so many tremendous baseball talents who didn't hit the ground running it just mm-hmm. it's, it seems like there's just a curve you know it takes a while to kind of figure it out but I feel sorry for the kid maybe I, maybe he's just pressing right now. there's plenty of guys who came up I mean Willie Mays came up you know, remember we did I mean, a Mike, Mays Mike podcast Trout. on NBC. One home run in his first 25 at bats. And what Warren Spahn said, I, I should have struck out this Mays guy, then we'd never have to worry about it. Robin Ventura came up and couldn't buy a hit. Um, Mike Trout had a really bad first half season with the Angels. There's a million mm-hmm. guys. Jackson Holiday could still be a wonderful player, but I'm, I'm concerned about him. The other player I'll mention, and I think we may have talked about him last week, is Aaron Nola. He picked up a win on the weekend, I believe, but velocity's down. He's never been a big strikeout guy. Strikeouts are down. Walks are up. I hate their defense. We always hate their defense. And the ERA estimators say that 316 is a total mirage. I I would love, if you had pitching depth, we always talk about this. Don't scream out you want to trade somebody. I'd say I got good pitching depth and see if you can maybe get close to full value on, on Aaron Nola. I think I'd like to get out of the Aaron Nola business. Yeah, all, all three of my guys are hitters. Um, Will Benson. Uh, Will Benson is hitting 186 so far in the year. Um, I know he's walking over 12% of the time, but he has a 38% strikeout rate, and TJ Friedel is about to start a rehab assignment. Um, I think that then pushes you know, Friedel into an everyday role, and Benson and Jake Fraley are now starting to share a little bit more playing time. Benson obviously could be DHing. We know that Nick Martini is doing a lot of DHing versus righties, so I still think there is playing time to be had for Benson given the injuries. But I don't think we're getting the breakout that that people were thinking. That the plate discipline, the strikeout rate, um, it it is concerning. Um, Nick Castellanos is another one. I told people in my waiver wire article this weekend to hold Nick Castellanos, and I still believe you should hold Nick Castellanos because we know he has a track record of success and he hits in a good lineup in a good park. And so I'm not cutting him, you know, before the calendar flips to May. But he has the sixth highest swinging strike rate among all qualified hitters in baseball and is swinging out of the zone 42% of the time. So he's a power hitter chasing outside of the zone, swinging and missing a lot. That's something he started to do at the second half of last year, but he was still hitting for power. Um, It's continuing, and now he's not hitting for power. I wasn't drafting him coming into the year. I have a little bit of concerns. And then the last one is Nolan Gorman who I'm also holding on because he's a young hitter and I do believe there's upside here and he has three home runs. So he he can make authoritative contact. My concerns are that he is 0 for 13 with eight strikeouts over his last three games, but that is connected to him being the having the fifth highest swinging strike rate among all qualified hitters so far this year. There is too much swing and miss in his game at the present moment. Um, 
I don't think anything's going to happen until Tommy Edmond comes back, and then that could put pressure on them to to put you know Gorman in the minors. So you've got some weeks, and I think he has the talent to figure things out. But I'm a little concerned right now. Yeah, one other player who fits that mold of he's slumping. He has a job now, but eventually they're going to have a glut as Jonathan India off to just a horrible start with the Reds. It's been a l- little bit of bad luck here. His expected average is actually 274, but his expected slugging is 359. And that's uh, you rostered India thinking he'd hit maybe 20 home runs. Maybe he'd run a little bit more as a team where everybody runs like crazy, but he only has two stolen bases. Mm-hmm. I'm just afraid that if he doesn't, mark his territory a little bit in the next, I don't know, three to five weeks. They're going to have too many options at some point when people come back and get healthy. Who knows? Maybe other guys will get hurt. That will never be a problem. And India's, India's had injury problems sometimes. as well. Yeah, so there are a couple of leagues, like 12-teamers, where I had India. There's a player I wanted to pick up. And I looked really long and hard. I'm like, I can't try, cut Jonathan India, can I? I ultimately, I didn't do it. I kept him. I'm going to, you know, it's, it's still April 22nd, but He's on the he's on the you know he's on the watch list right now. He's on probation right now. I'm not I might have benched him in a league or two. I'm not cutting him. I'm not giving up on you, Jonathan India, but just know, you know, I'm not I, I don't have five months for this. I you know you're you're on like a six week contract for me. I agree. Um I held on to him, Christian Encarnacion Strand in a few places. Yep. Um, and so I think you gotta hold on to those guys. Candelario isn't that. hitting either, and he's got the contract that kind of bails him out. We talked about like there's no good pickups for Casas. Candelario has been dropped in a lot of Yahoo leagues. If you want to mm-hmm. just say, well, the contract is going to keep him in the lineup. It's still and Cincinnati. It will. It's a great hitter park. Maybe he could be a temporary fill-in for you. Potentially, yeah. Um, hopefully, that was enough guys to to pick up to you know to hold on to to worry about. Um, Scott and I tried to cover all of that. Uh, we're going to be back on Wednesday with more news and notes, and also looking at some early exit velocity leaders. Um, batted ball event dip metrics are going to start to stabilize this week, so we're going to try to see if we can uh, give you some guys who are hitting the ball harder in meaningful ways than they were last year. So uh, you can check us out on Twitter. I am at Samsky. NYC. Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski. And we'll see you on Wednesday for another episode of the Roto World Baseball Show.